We are nearly at the halfway mark. It says night four. Tomorrow will be the halfway mark. And we will have five nights left until the day of Ashura. Every year, Muharram comes and it flies by. We don't know whether or not we will have another year with the commemoration of Imam al Hussein. But as the famous or the poet says, Sache, Garjiye Saad Bhad Pir Karege Yagam. Or Agar Mar Gaye To Yehoga Alam, High of Souls Jeeb Har Kiroe Naham. That if we get the blessing of living another year, we will continue in the gham or the suf or the commemoration or the suffering of Muhammad wa al Muhammad. And if we die before the year ends and the next Muharram comes, then we will cry over the fact that we were not able to mourn Imam al Hussein properly. Brothers and sisters, it is very important for us to understand that Karbala means quite literally breaking the idols of ignorance. Imam al Hussein was that individual who, well, while at the level of Ismat al Kubara, he made his companions so much that there was no difference between the thought of the Imam and the follower and the Ma'asum and the non Ma'asum and the elderly and the six month old and the youth. Everybody was at that same level of Yaqeen. Of course, when we talk about the Yaqeen of Imam Hussein, it is very high. What is the proof? The Quran says it. And what our Ayyimah have said is the Surah of Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the dawn walayal al ash and by the ten nights. And they say the ten nights are the ten nights of the month of Muharram. Some have said, according to our brothers, it might be the ten nights of Laila al Qadr, the last ten nights of Ramadan, or the ten nights around the day of Arafah. But we believe it is Layal al Ashr, which is the ten nights that culminate in the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein. And what does the Allah complete this ayat with? Ya ayyatuhan nafs al mutma'inna. O satisfied soul, irji'i ila rabbika radiyatun mardiyya. Return to your Lord for the Khuli fi Abadi wa the Khuli Jannati. Of course, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying Imam al Hussein is Nafsul Mutma'inna, then surely Imam al Hussein is Nafsul Mutma'inna. But let me ask you this Does Bibi Zainab, isn't she at that level? Abu Fadl Abbas at that level? Of Nafs? Al Yaqeen, complete, absolute Yaqeen. After all, there are the son and the daughters of the one who said, if all the hijabat between me and my God were lifted, there would not be a single increase in my iman, a decrease or increase in my iman. My iman would be the same. Why? Because Ali does not worship a God he does not see. Not with these eyes, but with the eyes of the mind and the heart. Why? Because Zainab does not worship a God she does not see. Not with the physical eyes, but with the eyes of the mind and the heart. Whereby, when we say, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna, this Surah Al Fajr is also called Surah Al Hussein. And when we say Surah Al-Hussein, 
This idea of nafsul mutma'inna is very important in the spiritual development of the human being. You see, when we get too much trials and suffering, we think Allah has forgotten us. But the hadith say, when Allah loves His servant, He surrounds them with trials and tribulations. Allah loves you, surrounds you with trials and tribulations. I don't know if there are any doctors in this audience. I know Brother Jawid, who was with us last year, he's a doctor. He sees patients with difficulties. But those patients with difficulties, if they have Iman that there will be a better day, this Iman uplifts them. I worked as a chaplain for almost a year, a year and a half, did, did, did my internship and in chaplaincy. And you experience patients of all sorts. One guy had no legs because he was diabetic and they amputated his legs and his fingers were gone and his toes were gone and everything. Then another guy who was, had a cancer, cancerous tumor the size of his thigh. Doctors gave him less than six months to live. What happened to him? The one with the faith kept on being cheery, even though he had his legs amputated, his toes amputated, his fingers amputated. But there was this idea that God still loves me. Whereas the one who had tumor the size of his leg, he was Jewish by birth, non-practicing by faith, and because he was more non-believing in God, he did not have a pole to surround him with, to latch onto, to bring him out. Obviously, I'm not saying deny the science. I'm not. But let's go to another level now. When Allah loves somebody, He surrounds them in trials and tribulations. I want to go even more extreme in the example. Why is suicide haram? Taking of a life is haram. Why? I don't necessarily know the Islamic, the, the Sharia reason. I give you my reason. Suicide is when somebody loses hope in everything, and they even lose hope in God, and therefore they take their life. Losing hope in God is haram. That is why one of the, the reasons I believe is one of the reasons suicide is haram. Because you lose faith in God, you don't have any reason to live anymore. Allah wants everybody to know that when He loves somebody, they surround, He surrounds them in trials and tribulation. If I have problems financially, if someone is depressed, or someone has a mental condition, somebody cannot pay their mortgage, somebody has children who don't listen to them, somebody, parents who don't take care of the children. Wherever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves his servant, completely covers him head to toe, down to bottom, puts him in a circle of complete trials and tribulations to a point that he cannot get out. But, but there is hope. What is the hope? The hope is when you logic your way to God, God brings you out of it. Let me say this. If you were to counter somebody who had this problem about not having hope in anything, even not God, you, they might say their parents don't love them. They might say their siblings don't love them. They might say they have no friends. They might say they're being bullied in school. They might say all of that. 
But at the end of the day, the question is, does God not love me? If I take this hadith and I say, Allah is expressing His love for me in testing me. Why? Remember, Abu Abdullah al Hussein in one of his khutbat on the day of Ashura, he says, if this world was meant for anybody, the prophets of God were the most deserving of it. Yani, if the Anbiya did not remain in this world and they did not have the blessing to destroy the majority of them, then what about you and me? We don't have those blessings. But the Anbiya of God did not have those blessings. They went through trials and tribulations. Imagine being the Reno, preaching for a thousand years, nobody listens, and he built an ark. And there's a bunch of dua after a thousand years. Imagine being Nabi Ibrahim, seeing your nation worshiping idols. Imagine being thrown into the fire pit. But Allah helps those who serve Him. The fire pit turns into a bed of roses. No dua gets accepted, nobody's left except his true believers. Nabi Isa in the Bible says, I am the king of your hearts, while there is a physical kingdom. Why? In our traditions, when he is about to be killed, Allah brings him to paradise physically. And the one who was about to find Nabi Isa Yehuda, or they call him Judas, in English, or Judah, in English, Allah make him look like Nabi Isa, makes him look like Nabi Isa, and he gets put on the cross. Nabi Muhammad got the most suffering. Got the most suffering. The Arab Quraysh did not leave him alone at all. When he was under the protective shadow of Abu Talib and Khadija al Kubra, even then he went through trials and tribulations. Abu Lahab, every time Nabi Muhammad wants to say something he gets up and says, Muhammad is a magician, he made this small goat for all of us and we ate it and we were full. He practiced some type of magic. We as the Quraysh can eat a full goat by ourselves. But his wife, put thorns in the way of Muhammad, dried wood in his path. They even had the children against Muhammad. They even had the children of Prophet against Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad would go to preach, their children would throw stones and sticks at him. So when Abu Sufyan told the children to throw stones and six at him. Abu Talib found out this was Abu Sufyan's doing. He said, Abu Sufyan, tell these children to stop. Tell, tell them to stop. And then Abu Sufyan says, oh, Abu Talib, this is a matter of children. This is a matter of children. Let us have it remain in the children. And Abu Talib said, fine, I have a child as well. Ali, go where Muhammad is going to defend him. Somebody wants to throw a stone and Muhammad would hit them, break their leg or their ribs or their punch them or get into a fight with them. So when these children went back home, Khatib Akbar Lama Majata had a very beautiful statement. The parents would ask you, that 
Who did this to you? They kept on saying Ali, 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 meaning in the household of the kuffar of the Arab, even they said Ali, 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 Ali. It is woe to the Muslim who does not realize the greatness of Ali, that even those who oppose Prophet Muhammad realize his greatness, but the Muslims want to sideline him completely. Praise the Lord. This Iman, we are the followers of the one, and my topic right here is the role of reason and spiritual development. This Iman, Iman e Kulli, where Ali ibn Abi Talib has the Iman as a 13 year old defending Islam is the Iman of the follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib, I don't know if I said this here or before, where the hadith, hadith say, Al-Haqq ma'a Ali wa Ali ma'a Al-Haqq. Allah turn Haqq wherever Ali goes. Ali is the mizan for Haqq, not the not Haqq the mizan for Ali. For eight billion human beings alive today, countless who will be in the future, and those who lived in the past, Haqq is the mizan. But for Haqq, Ali is the mizan. For Haqq, Ali is the mizan. Yani Ali's iman is so common that even Haqq has to turn the way of Ali ibn Abi Talib. On Mahshar, we believe we will go through or pass through the bridge of Sirat. And in Surah Al Fatiha, we say, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqeen. Imam Ali says, Ana Sirat al Mustaqeen. I am the path that you have to cross. And you know how hard this path is? I remember reading a book once. It was called, I forget the name of the book, Presence of Heart. And it was about the life of Imam Khomeini. In his last few days, he kept on coming in and out of coma. One time he passed for about eight hours. He passed out. He was unconscious for about eight hours. When he gained consciousness, his daughter says, Oh, Father, what happened? He says, For eight hours I was traversing the path of the Salat of Mahsar. I was traversing the path of Salat and it took me a full eight hours to get through that bridge. Take it as you will, but eight hours to get through a bridge who is lighter or thinner than a hair. We believe in the Irfan, I believe personally, there's a reason why I say Imam Khomeini, and many times when I say Imam Khomeini, I say alayhi salam afterwards as well. If you know his Irfan, how strong he was, for him to say it took me the full time of my being passed out is a very difficult statement. That is itself a test. When we say we have the Iman of the follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib, we need to have the follower of the Iman of the follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Where we do not sacrifice anything for this world, we sacrifice everything for the hereafter. I'm not saying go live in the mountains and as a hermit, no. Live in this world, but do everything for the hereafter. Do everything you can for the preparation of the hereafter, 
where you will be put forth in front of the video of your deeds of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very interesting. He has a DVD player and he puts on the DVDs of your life on Mahsha to show you everything that you do. I am dating myself when I say DVD player. Now it's, I, I don't know what, like MP, whatever. He puts on the video and you watch. So every lie I did, every transgression I made, every time I yelled at my parents, every time I forgot my prayer, every time I had disrespect towards my siblings or my fellow human beings, every time I violated the law of God, it's put in front of me. And you know what the sad point is? There is an even sadder point to that. Let me make the happy point, then I'll get to the even sadder point. When I look at my life on Mahshar, I should have the Iman in my deeds that when Allah shows me this picture or this video of my life, that I say I did nothing except submit myself completely to the will of Allah. That I submit completely and wholeheartedly to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That I do everything to please my Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt and I am Ahlul Bayt. I do everything. <coughs> Sometimes, even in the Majlis of Imam Hussein, we have this discussion. And it's not just about the sisters. You talk about the brothers. I, Alhamdulillah, since December I've been in Iraq. I moved, joined the house in, and you go to the haram in the men's side. The men are not in proper hijab. Jeans that are skin tight, that reveal the shape of your aura, your, your private parts, they are haram on men. Yet you go to the haram, and men have the one. We talk about sisters. Sometimes, as followers of Ahl al-Bayt, we believe that in every majlis, and in every mahfil, Rasulullah is here, Amir al-Mu'mineen is here, Fatima al-Zahra is here, Ayyam Ahl al-Bayt are here, Imam al-Sajjad is here, Imam Mahdi is here. Fatima to Zahra is here. Sayyidina Zainab is here. Yet in this present mahfil where all of Allah's chosen people are here, all of Ahl al-Bayt, why is it sometimes, some many times that the hijab is either off or not proper? Why? Because we don't have the ma'rif of the Imam. Imagine right now in the sister of Fatima to Zahra could be sitting right next to you. In that space or that space or that space. We have a space right here. All of Ahl al-Bayt will be sitting right here. In the shoes, Imam al-Sajjad would be there. Preparing the shoes. So when we say they are here, belief and Iman in their presence is part of the ma'rifah. It's part of this love and respect that we have for them. Look, Fatima <laughs> Zahra does not need our hijab. Amir al-Mu'mineen does not need our hijab. He is the ma'asum. When we have these gatherings, when we sit down, we need each other's hijab so that our desires do not go astray. We need this. Further, Allah does not need our prayer if we say that Allah does not need our prayer, then what is His prayer for? It's for us. It comes back to us. Prayer, at the very least, is meant to give meaning to life. I see a lot of Arab speakers 
here. I'm speaking as a non-Arab speaker. So when I became Balik, and I before I was Balik, I was not 100% practicing. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I'll be honest with you. But this institution brought me to the path of following religion. I would, after Salat, open up the Risala of Sayyid Sistani and read the definition of the prayer because I didn't know what I was saying. If you want your children to pray or to follow Islam, the worst thing you can do for them is force them to do it. Because once that force is removed, there is no impetus for them to practice Islam. Again, I'm using my own example. I used to force Islam on my family. Once that impetus was removed, they didn't have to. They found God on their own. Raise the intellectual and the reasoning level and the iman of your children so that they themselves would love to follow the path of Islam. They go to college. They see everything. I mentioned it yesterday, the day before. Forget college. They see everything in high school. I went to an American high school. They see everything. All that that happens in college happens in high school as well. And this is not something new. One of the reasons why I went to Hawzeh was to show people what the true scholar, inshallah, I'm not, I am not at that level where I can say I am there, but what the true scholar of Muhammad is like. Why? I, when I went to my teachers, Ayatollah Sajid, Ayatollah Sabiri, I saw that a regular person, their intellect is this little. A scholar, a regular scholar, their intellect is this little. When you go in front of the scholar of Al Muhammad, their knowledge, their hikmah, their ilm, their sabr, their haiba, their shuja'a, their hilm, their, their love and compassion is like you have all of the seven oceans of the world in front of you. And you do not want to go to anybody else. There is no reason then to go to anybody else. So, today, let us make this promise. Let us make this promise. One thing, I'm not forcing anything, especially for the kids, but for those of us who don't, whose Arabic is not the native language. When you pray, have the Risala of your Majahitimi next to you. After the prayer, you will, you open the Risala to the page of the translation of the prayer and read that. This, if you do that, I consider the whole Majalis to be complete. Look at what God is saying to you. And of course, they say, if you want to talk to God, you pray. If you want God to talk to you, you open up the Quran and start reading. You want to talk to God. You're talking to the one who has absolute authority over everything. Who does not need anything. Whose prayer, who, whose prayer you perform is for really for yourself. It's for your own character development, your own spiritual development, your own nafs development. I believe I said this earlier as well. Sometimes, many times there is a distance in my life as well between our prayer and our daily life. The one scholar, I forget who, maybe, I don't, I don't remember the name of the scholar, but they say somebody came up to him and he said to him, Ya Sheikh or Ya Sayyid, there I want to get up for Salat al-Layl. 
yet I sleep throughout, I don't even want to perfect it. He gets his, he, he goes to the guy's ear and he says, perform this amal that I'm telling you in your ear, and you will get up for Fatah again. He performs it, day passes, doesn't come up, two days passes, doesn't wake up, day four, five, week passes, comes up to the alim and says, Ya Sheikh, Ya Sayyid, your amal did not work. He said to him, something in his ear, you know what he said? How can you expect your words to work if you beat and disrespect your wife and your children? If there is a disconnect between what Allah wants to you outside your prayer, how can you believe that your prayer is going to have meaning? Or you're going to value your prayer? If I live without hudur, qalbi, zahni, just in every zahni in my life, how can I expect this 10 minute that I pray, the whole asr, 5 minute for Fajr, 10 minute for Maldivain, how can I expect this to have meaning? Have meaning by living in this world, but living with the presence of heart. Living with the presence of mind, my time in normal self. But you know what? Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Mistakes, Allah left them there so that we would feel humble. Imam Khomeini, like I was quoting before, he says, not even mistakes, sin. Some people they say Allah created sin. No, He didn't create sin. He didn't create haram, no. But what happens is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the free will to decide. Allah gave us the free will to decide. And Allah, and He says, the hadith states, this is in Shahabta and Hadith, 40 hadith of Imam Khomeini. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made sin so that man could not feel the sin of pride. All the other sin exists so that these shoulders can be lowered. He didn't make sin, I'm sorry. He let it happen because he did not want people to feel pride. The mistakes are there. But I should not have to cup in my body. The mistakes are there. And of course, tonight we talked about Karbala. Tonight we will talk about the companions of Allah to that Dear brothers and sisters, I want to mention two companions tonight. Two companions tonight. The one who came from Abu Abdullah al Hussein from the Yazid's camp, Al Hod ibn Yazid al Ayah. And the other who came from Kufa, Al Habib al Mubah al Asad. I want to say this, and everybody take this to heart. Hur was not the only person who left Yazid's side to Imam Hussein. Half of those who fought for Imam Hussein left Yazid's side to Imam Hussein. Around 30 plus individuals left Yazid's side to Imam Hussein. Hur is the one who stops Imam Hussein from entering the city of Kufa. They have an interlock, and Hur says something to which Imam al Hussein alayhi salam says, Oh Hur, may your mother mourn your loss. To which he says, If your mother was anybody other than Fatima to Sahara, I would have said something. Imam al Hussein knew Hur. He wanted to wake the Jazba in Hur. Look where you are at, and look where I am at. Look whose father you follow. 
Look who is my mother. Look who is Yazid's father and grandfather. Look who is my grandmother, my grandfather. Look who is my mother, Fatima. If you can stand, if you can stand being on Yazid's side, how can you stand the displeasure of Fatima to Sahara? Hur, they say, they say, Hur is the one who prevented Imam al Hussein from entering the city of Kufa. Hur is the one who forced Imam al Hussein to go through the wilderness. Hur is the one that all the suffering of Imam al Hussein's forces happened because of Hur. Hur is the reason why they are in Karbala. Hur is the reason why their camps were removed from the riverbank. Hur is the reason that, that Hur is the original cause, the reason why Ahl al Bayt have been thirsty for the past three days. They say on the night of Ashura, on Shabi Ashur, Hur was seen. Hur was seen. He was seen contemplating, moving from about to left to right, pacing. And they say that he was uneasy. One person came up to him and he said to him, Oh Hur, if we had seen you before this night, we would say that you are the bravest of the Arabs. They say, What's happened to you now, Hur? He says to them, I see Jannah and Jahannam in front of me. The, the, the son comes to his father. He says, Father, what are your plans? What happened, Father? They say, you hear the, they say, Hul says, the, do you hear the sound of Al-Atash, Al-Atash there because of your father, Hul? The son asks, Father, what are you going to do? He says, I am going to join Hussein. I'm going to join Hussein. The son says, Father, take me too. The slave says, Master, take me too. They say that when Hur came to Imam Hussein, they say when Hur came to Imam Hussein, he wanted to go, but he said, son, tie my hands and my feet, because these are the hands that stopped Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein on the, on the tenth of Muharram, he heard somebody coming, Abu al-Fadl Abbas, he said to him, Abbas, go look who is coming. They say Imam Hussein said it was, found out it was, it was Hur. Imam Hussein greets Hur. Hur says, oh master, have you forgiven me? He says, Hur, my mother, my father, I, everybody has forgiven you. He says, Hur, Sayyidina Zainab sends you her salams. And then they say, they say that Hur ibn Yazid al was the first to ask permission to go fight. The famous scholar of the Indo Box of Continents, Alama Naqan, Sayyid Ali Naqi Naqi, Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Naqi Naqi, used to say, Why did Imam al Hussein grant Hud the first permission to go fight? It is customary in the Middle Eastern and the Islamic culture that when you have a guest, you give him something to eat and to drink. Imam al Hussein said to Hud, Hud, I don't have anything to eat or to drink. But my grandfather Rasulullah is waiting for you with a with a cup from the pond of Kawthar, with Hawdi Kawthar. Go. They say that Hur of the Yazid al Yahi, I will conclude with these points, dear brothers and sisters. They say that Al Hur of the Yazid al Yahi, he asked his son permission to go first. His son went to go first. They say when his son came, his son went to fight. His son went to fight. He fought valiantly, he fought bravely. After his son was struck and he fell and he was about to call pray, he was about to breathe his last. All the companions of Abu Abdullah and Hussein would say, Assalamu alaykum ya Abu Abdullah. <coughs> Hur was watching his son. When he, watching his, when he was watching his son breathe his last, he came to his son. He realized that there was his master Hussein before him who had came to his son. He says to him, Oh Master, why are you here? This is the body of your slave, son, the son of your slave. He says to him, 
who hurt a young, an elderly father should never have to pick up the dead body of his son or the martyred body of his son. I ask you, dear brothers and sisters, I ask you, dear brothers and sisters, I ask her, her Hussein is here with you right now. Where were you? Where were you? When Abba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam, he saw Ali Akbar fall from his horse. They say Imam al Hussein lost his eyesight when Ali Akbar fell from his horse. He could not see anything. He says to him, O oh son, call, call me, call on me, so I can listen to your voice and follow the voice to guide me to where you are. They say Al Hussein alayhi salam. I want to talk about the martyrdom of Hur as well. They say Al Hussein alayhi salam. He went to the body of Ali Akbar. Ali Akbar was hiding something in his chest. Imam Al Hussein opened his arm. He saw the head of the spear. They say, dear brothers and sisters, after Hur, his son went to go fight. Hur went to go fight. Someone he was breathing his last. They say somebody hit his head, his forehead. They say that when he hit his forehead and he fell, he called out to Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein rushed to his friend Hud ibn Yazid al Riahi, who had just repented from the from the mistake that he had made. Imam al Hussein took this handkerchief that Fatima al Zahara had made. He tied it on the forehead of Hud ibn Yazid al Riahi and Hud was the first one of the first shaheed of Muhammad's forces in Allah yeah. wa inna ilayhi raji'oon ma atam al-Hussain Ya Hussain Ya Hussain Ya Hussain